Good morning, London. Hello. Okay, I, I, I told the people Nicely in the front done. to like, good morning, London. Air. <laughs> Thank for you. A week. I'm uh, Chris Lorenzo. I'm John Riviello. And now we have to share the Beef Wellington story. So when I travel, I don't really set goals for myself as far as where I'm going to go eat or what I'm going to go see. I usually leave that up to my wife. But unfortunately, due to some poor planning on our part, she's currently eight and a half months pregnant. And, and we're here. Yeah, we're here. Apparently, it's really hard to travel when you're pretty pregnant. Um, so she's at home watching right now. Hi, love. And we set this goal because my wife is a foodie. We watch Master Chef together with Gordon Ramsay. I'm sure some people might have heard of Gordon Ramsay. He's apparently from the UK. And um, every year, he makes the contestants make a beef Wellington. I'm like, wow, a beef Wellington. So this is a beef Wellington. It's kind of like a polymer app. It has the app shell, and inside you put the meat, um, and it's just delicious. So I asked my wife, where can we get this beef Wellington? And she tells us about Grenadier Pub. So John and I venture out. We go see the Changing the Guards at Buckingham Palace, and we go to Grenadier, and we're sitting there, and we look up at the ceiling, and we're like, look at all this American currency. Wait a minute, we're Americans. <laughs> I have a dollar bill. John's a graphics designer. So I pull out the dollar bill. The bartender gives us a marker. Hand the dollar bill to John. And, and we're talking. We're like, what should we do? And I'm wearing my Liberty JS shirt, which has a Liberty Bell on it. We're from Philly. We're from Philadelphia. So we're like, OK, we'll put the Liberty Bell on there, which happens to ironically represent you know, America's exit from the UK. Um, <laughs> So we decided to put that on there, and we put, of course, the polymer symbol. And so we got up on a bar stool, glued it to the ceiling, and if you go to the pub, it's on the left-hand side, you can look up, and uh, you can get a Beef Wellington there or a Bloody Mary. They're famous for both of those. So yes, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about uh, Comcast. That's a company we worked for back in the US. We're based out of Philadelphia. Comcast is the largest cable TV and internet service provider in the US. It's a Fortune 50 company. We have over 30 million customers, and we own NBC Universal. So that includes the whole family of TV shows, movies, and theme parks. So my cousin that works at Harry Potter World at Universal Studios in Orlando, Florida, works for the same company that I do, which is pretty cool. And she's a cooler job than I, I think. Um, and we use Polymer, of course, and we have over 500 components that we've created. So we get to work on a variety of different web technologies at Comcast. To give you an overview of some of that stuff, this here is the My Xfinity website. This is where a lot of our customers start their days to get the latest news, check the weather, check their email. And this was built with Ruby on Rails. This is the My Account website. And this allows customers to go in, view their bill, pay their bill. If they're having issues, they can troubleshoot their equipment. They can manage their account, stuff like that. And this was actually built with Angular. So here we have the Xfinity home site. This was our first Polymer app, which we started with Point3. It has half a million customers, and it allows our customers to control their security system, change locks, or turn, turn on and off lights, change their thermostat. Um, we also have the X1 platform, and this is Comcast's premier TV experience. It's actually one of the best ways to watch television. The guide is awesome. And we make this guide available on all platforms. And if you happen to be using the web one, that's also written in Polymer, and it serves over a million customers a day. And so the first question is, why Polymer? Why did we choose Polymer? And so the story starts two and a half years ago when our product team asked us to build the Xfinity Home. And of course, this is the final product. It didn't look like this when we started. Um, but we had this new project, and we got to choose whatever framework we wanted. So as a lead, it was my job to start researching what was available. And as everybody knows, there are like hundreds of frameworks available. But I narrowed it down to Angular and React. And I was checking them out. And I'm like, I've been a web developer for 15 years. I didn't really feel too comfortable with these frameworks. And so I'm talking to my buddy Phil at work one day. And just to give you a little background on Phil, he's the guy who lives on the cutting edge. He reads all the latest news blogs. And he watches all the latest Chrome developer tools. And he's like, 
service workers, and this is two and a half years ago, like as soon as it was available in Chrome Canary, he's like, we should be using this in production and fetch and promises. And I'm like, Phil, just calm down. We gotta wait until our customers actually have this. So I'm talking to him, and he's like, we should use Polymer. This is my son, Theo. I taught him to say progressive web apps. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so cute when he says it. He says, progressive web apps. <laughs> and he understands like, the sounds, and he can repeat it back to me, but he has no idea what it means. <laughs> and that's kind of how I felt when Phil said, we should use Polymer. But unlike my son, I was actually able to use the internet and can Google it and was like, OK, what's Polymer? So I started looking through the documentation on Polymer and checking it out. And I got the team together, and it was time for us to make a decision. So of course, we asked the whiteboard what we should do. And we created a pros and cons column for whether we should use Polymer. And one of the big things that we really liked about it was that it was backed by Google. And like, I am just overwhelmed, impressed by the Google team, by the Polymer team, and how great their engineers are at building stuff. The other thing that I really like about Polymer is it's future-oriented, right? Web Components spec is going to be built into browsers, so eventually all the polyfills go away, and we get great speed from that. Also, the documentation on the Polymer website is amazing. Their technical writers are great and probably don't get enough applause, and we should probably applause for them. So thank you, Polymer technical writers. That's going to be our best applause of the day. That's great. Um, and developers always like doing something new. But some of the cons at the time was, like, this wasn't even beta. We were looking at 0.3. And it wasn't even alpha. Apparently, Taylor was like, oh, this was experimental. And I'm like, I didn't get the memo for that. Um, and at the time, Polymer 0.1 five and below use Shadow DOM. And we were trying to write tests for that, and Selenium had no idea what Shadow DOM was. So we were trying to like click on a button that was in the Shadow DOM, and Selenium was like, I don't know where this button is. I can't find this button. So there was no testing. There was no tooling. Web Component Tester was not out yet. Um, and there was limited browser support. It was IE 10 and above. But for Xfinity Home, we had to use WebSockets. So we were OK with that. And of course, we decided to go ahead with Polymer. And when we first started, I was really nervous because we were building a production-ready app for half a million customers in an experimental technology. And when I first started, I was, I was really nervous. Like, I was just like, I was on the con side too, by the way. <laughs> I was like, we need to abandon ship. We should switch to Angular or React. But as we were developing and we were like discovering and getting over the hurdles, I really enjoyed Polymer and I really enjoyed web components to the point where I'm excited to go around talking about web components and telling all the other web developers out there, like, you should be using web components. They're great. And I'm especially excited where the project's going with Polymer 2.0. So ultimately, we did finish the site. You can see here's another page of our devices. Each one of those pieces that you see on there is a component. So we have the XH thermostat. We have XH light. And it's really great when your UX team comes to you and is like, hey, can we put that light on the overview page? And we're like, yeah, sure, it's just a tag. Like, it's no problem. Um, but we started the site with Polymer 0.3. We eventually released with the Polymer 0.56. And as we were releasing, Polymer's like, OK, we got a 0.8 version, and we're checking out the 0.8 version. And then they're like, OK, here's the 1.0. And now you got to upgrade. And we're like, oh, great, we'll upgrade. And I'm telling them, Phil, like, oh, this should only take a couple weeks, right? It's no problem. He's like, no, this is going to be hard. <laughs> And we spent three months upgrading. So I'm really excited about Polymer 2.0 and that Google understands the pain of upgrading. And I'm excited about hybrid mode. And I'm looking forward to a, a better experience upgrading. So let's talk about sharing. And if you're playing slide deck bingo, there are Legos on this one. So keep paying attention to different slide deck bingo items. This is a picture of my kids sharing Legos. And as I've learned, sharing does not come instinctively when you're a child. You don't want to naturally share your toys. Um, and as you learn to share, there's some screaming and some crying involved. And this is kind of like learning how to share components with Polymer. Um, but I promise you can get through it without any screaming or crying. So it's this potential to reuse components that got people really excited about Polymer at Comcast because before Polymer was even a term in the vocabulary at Comcast, 
we were already looking at how can we make a consistent user experience across all of our devices. Because again, we're building for TVs, tablets, phones, laptops, watches now, of course. So our UX team put together this presentation on what they called modular design systems, where basically a, symbol, a single component could appear different based on the context. So here's an example here of the Xfinity Homes arm disarm widget um, in the usual context on the right-hand side. And on the left, you can see the way it could appear behave in a different context. So we're no longer designing and developing websites. What we're building instead are components that can expose functionality on any website. See your camera, record a TV show, pay your bill, really anything. So when the Xfinity Home team started talking about the potential of sharing components with Polymer, this got everyone really excited. UX was excited, product, business. I heard executives that weren't technical saying the word Polymer in meetings. I'm like, what is going on here? This is really catching on. So a little over a year ago, I hadn't had a chance to work with Polymer yet. And then that day came when my boss comes to me and he says, so John, the Xfinity home team, they've been building with Polymer a lot. I'm talking all about sharing components. It's time to actually prove that this is actually a possibility. So what I want you to do is take that Xfinity home arm disarm widget and put it on the My Xfinity website for a demo in two weeks. Whoa, 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 whoa. And I'm like, ah, all right, that sounds cool. You know, I've never used Polymer before, but I'm excited for the opportunity. And so I go ahead and I look at it. I'm like, okay, you look at the documentation. Documentation's went pretty well. I go and look at the Xfinity home code base. I'm like, okay, there is a bunch of components here. I figure out which one is the arm disarm widget. I'm like, all right, how am I actually gonna take this component and put it on the My Xfinity website? Not, not exactly sure. So I talked to the Xfinity Home developers and the immediate response is like, whoa, slow down, buddy. You know, you can't just take a component and drop it on another website. And I'm like, but that's what we sold this on. That's how we got the company to use it. And then in talking to them, it became obvious. I mean, they, as Chris said, they started building with 0.3, they upgraded to 0.5, they upgraded to 1.0. So they were learning Polymer as the Polymer team was learning Polymer. Now they didn't have time to focus on making a shareable component. They were learning on, you know, how do I make a, ship this app, ship this website. Um, but that didn't change my demo date. I still had two weeks. So Chris and I, we worked together. We looked at the My Xfinity website. We're like, okay, where are we going to put this thing? We looked at it on the right-hand side. There was a spot, so we put it on the right there. And then in two weeks, I was at the demo, and I successfully armed my security system at my house from the My Xfinity website. And this was a defining moment for Polymer Comcast, because this proved that, yes, we can actually create shareable, reusable components and use this across the board at the company. And this opened up the door for more projects to actually be using Polymer. So right now, Chris and I have been working on a number of projects over the past year. And we knew when we were starting these projects that we wanted to build shareable, reusable components. This was a, a key aspect of what we were going to build. So we set out to build these components that were actually going to be shared across websites. And now that we've been doing this for a number of months this year actively and actually sharing components, we can see what it's like to actually do this. And we've come up with a set of best practices for building shareable, reusable components. The first one is to use cores, which if you're not already familiar, is cross-origin resource sharing. This is what allows you to go ahead and if you're on one domain to make an API call with an AJAX or fetch to get data. So this allows you to get around the same origin policy by passing some headers that say, hey, I'd like to make a request here. And then if you're on the whitelist, you can get back that data right there. And this was a key piece of what we had to do for the Xfinity Home arm disarm widget because that was built for Xfinity Home. So when I dropped it on the My Xfinity website, it was expecting a relative path to the API, which didn't exist. I then hard coded it to go to the Xfinity Home website and the browser just said, uh-uh, not gonna happen. So we had to add the course headers there, and then we could then get that API to pass through to another website. Another thing is to separate the data from the UI. And what I mean by this is a single component should not be in charge of fetching, processing, and rendering data. Your UI component should take in the data it expects as attributes and properties and render it. Any processing should happen outside of it. We've actually tried to create data components, and that just strictly dealt with fetching data and processing it. And that had, it kind of worked. It had some issues. Chris will touch on those in a little bit. We've also tried Redux that in early indications seems to be working well. So those are other options. But the key thing is to separate your data from the UI there. We also care a lot about testing. So you may be wondering, do we practice test-driven development or TDD? 
We don't enforce that, some developers choose to, but what we do enforce is code coverage. So we use the Istanbul plugin for Web Component Tester, that's pretty much the industry standard for code coverage in JavaScript. And you can see here that one of our Palmer projects has nearly 100% test coverage. And for our shared components in each one of those repos, we actually require 100% test coverage across the board. And this, if you don't have 100% test coverage and you try to submit a pull request, it'll actually fail the CLI, or fail the CI for continuous integration. So we enforce this, and this helps make developers feel more confident about using these shared components because they know, they know that they've been fully tested. So again, we don't enforce TDD, but we do enforce DDD. And you're probably wondering what I'm talking about when I say that. And actually, Ben touched on this yesterday a bit, talking about how ING uses Polymer, and that is demo-driven development. And this is one thing that I love about what the Polymer team has done. So they've created these amazing library of open source components, and in addition to great documentation, they have these rich demo pages that show you exactly the code you need to use and how it's gonna look when you use that code. So we do the exact same thing. So here's, for example, again, that my Xfinity, or sorry, the Xfinity Home ARM to ARM widget, the two different ways that it could appear, and the code required to do it. And our teams have agreed that this definitely has helped focus them better on making shareable, reusable components, because when you're constantly looking at the demo page, it's pretty clear what your goals are and what you need to be building. This has other advantages as well. For one, it kind of forces you to think in shadow DOM, even if you're using shady DOM. And what I mean by that is we've had developers getting started with Polymer, and since we're using shady DOM by default, they'll have an element that's contained within a couple other elements, and then they'll set styles in the outer element that impacts the inner element. And that's technically possible because we're just polyfilling Shadow DOM, but if we were to turn on Shadow DOM, then that would break. And when you're building the different appearances of each component on the demo page and looking at it, it really forces you to think, okay, if this component needs to look a different way, I'm gonna go ahead and put that on the demo page. Another thing is, so we're, again, using these on multiple websites. If we make an update to a shared component, we want to have to go in and test that update on every individual website. If you have every use case on the demo page, it's much easier to just go ahead, look at the demo page, and if, the, if it works there, it's going to work well on the website. And then if there's a new use case you need to add, you just add it to the demo page, and then you're good to go. So remember, DDD is the answer to creating shareable, reusable components. Thanks. So I couldn't let John be the only one with an acronym. So I came up with SPC. <laughs> and SPC stands for Second Party Components. Or it could mean Shared Polymer Components. It really doesn't matter. Acronyms are everywhere. This one's not important. What I mean by it, though, is we have this thing called the Universal Header. And it appears on top of every one of our sites. And it also comes with a Universal Footer. And the product team wants to be able to have this header and footer be shared across all the sites and be easily updatable so that they can change the link and all the sites get it instantly. And this thing's been around for probably about seven years now. And when it originally started, it was a script tag that you would put on the page, which would then load two iframes, an iframe for the header, and an iframe for the footer. And everybody is already like, yes, it was an iframe. Um, it was pretty, pretty disgusting. And then we started using Ruby on Rails a little bit. And we started doing it server-side, so you can make a server-side call and get it included in the page and serve it before, before the user you know, needed it. Um, and then you know, we started doing these single-page apps, and like, we don't want a server anymore. So we came up with a new way of doing that, and what we're doing is we said, why don't we make this thing a web component? And we're like, yeah, web component sounds good. So what we did was we got the Polymer team, or the Polaris team, to create this universal header as a web component. And what you can do is you can actually import a web component from another domain, from another team. So we have another team building this navigation for us, and we import it into our project, and now we have an XC header and an XC footer tag that we can use just like normal DOM elements. We got rid of the iframe because you know, doing the iframe, it's really hard to do a responsive site and try to like change the size of an iframe and change the height. Like, good luck. Good luck trying that. But with this, we can now also talk to the header. We can pass it information. We can change its styling. We can change its Z index a lot easier if we have pop-ups. It's just all around much better. Also, when we first started with Polymer, 
we really drank the Kool-Aid and thought like everything should be a component. We were so excited, we were like, we gotta make it all a component. And so what happens is with a typical Polymer site, for instance, Xfinity Home, your code looks like this, where you load the polyfill, you load Polymer, you load your vulcanized assets, and by the way, vulcanization wasn't out when we first started. <laughs> I came later. Every time Polymer team like released a new tool, we we're like, yes, it's Christmas around here. Um, but you then put in one Polymer component or one, one component on the page, which is your XHApp. And then inside of XHApp is all these additional components. And you have authentication, you have your API calls that are happening, you have a login page, you have your overview page. And the problem with this is that performance matters. We need to get something in front of the users as quickly as possible. And for us, with the Xfinity Home site, we actually have to make an API call, which then goes all the way into the user's home, makes Zigbee calls for all their devices in their home, and then returns the status back up. That can take over two seconds. We have to remember that the color purple also matters. <laughs> so you can cross that off your bingo card. Um, so the, really the critical path for us was getting API calls happening as quickly as possible. And if you look at the developer tools, when you have XH app loading, the browser has to get the definition for that, stamp it into the DOM, then it's like, oh, look at all these other modules. I gotta get their definitions, stamp them into the DOM, do all this other work, and then it's like, oh, now I'll start making the API calls. So we were making API calls almost a second into the site loading for the user. And this was a big problem. So as web developers, and again, I've been developing for the web for 15 years now, we have to get back to our roots. And we need to remember that web components are just another tool in our toolbox. And really, like, this doesn't do us justice anymore because we have so many tools, we really need like a big red truck to carry around all our tools. Another bingo card, use the platform. This is the Polymer motto, right? Like, the platform hasn't changed. The browser is still the same browser that we've been using for 15 years. Yes, it's gotten better, it's gotten faster, it's been progressively enhanced, but it's still relatively the same. And so, we need to remember when we want something to happen sooner in the browser, all we have to do is put that piece at the top. And so what we did was we pulled out our authentication checking and our API calls and we stopped making them Polymer components. We just kept them as JavaScript, pure JavaScript. And we're actually checking whether the user is authenticated before we load up the app. And we start making the API calls as soon as they come to the site so we can get it because that's our critical path. And then while the calls are being made, we load the polyfills, we load the app, and we get started. So the user gets a much better experience. And We've also checked out this app shell architecture. It's always great because we build all these apps and then the Polymer team's like, here's the recommendation after we built this stuff. And we're like, cool, app shell architecture, it's pretty awesome. And for those who don't know, this is about splitting out your assets and, and giving a small package to the browser. Because it's a lot faster to process things that are small. But it takes advantage of this notion of unresolved elements. And what that means is when the browser sees a web component, anything with a hyphen in it, it goes, great, you're a web component. Wait a minute, I don't have your definition yet. So I'm just gonna keep track of you. You're in limbo, and as soon as I get your definition, I promise to come back and upgrade you. And we can take advantage of this just like the app shell architecture is doing. So here, for instance, is how we normally create a definition for XHAP. And by using IMD, yeah, another acronym, Import Module Definition. This is based on the AMD specification. It allows you to define modules. And this was written by the Polymer team um, to do modular definition with HTML imports. So now what we're doing is we're defining XHAP as a module. And we're able to push it down to the browser, but actually not load the definition yet. And by doing that, we can then have additional JavaScript, like this loader module, which can do checking of, hey, is the user authenticated? If they're not authenticated, I'm not gonna spend the 500 milliseconds to instantiate XHAP. I'm just gonna show them the login page or send them to the login page, because that's much faster than having to do all this JavaScript processing. So, 
That's it for performance. So we've been talking a lot about how to build these Polymer components well and effectively. Let's talk about building the team of engineers that are actually going to build these Polymer components and apps for you. So the people we've brought on to work on Polymer projects at Comcast, either externally or internally, probably only 20% had any experience with Polymer before working on these applications. And that really hasn't been an issue. And I really feel that that's due, again, to Polymer's missioning, which is to use the platform. So if you have engineers that have a solid understanding of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, that's all you really need. Again, the documentation for Polymer is great. You can go and look at the elements I've created, take a look at the documentation there, the demo pages. You can really get a quick understanding of how Polymer works. Chris and I also have run hands-on training sessions multiple times. And basically what we do is give a bunch of exercises. We'll then factor in, we'll bring in some of the videos from the Polymer Summit. So I'm excited to see that that library is now doubled in size. And we'll also, of course, use Polycast to bring in those videos as well. And that gets the team a nice quick introduction to how to use Polymer in production. And from leading those training sessions and also reviewing developers' code, we've realized that one of the hardest things for developers to wrap their head around initially are these core parts of web components. And that's encapsulation, composition, and separation of concerns. Polymer was designed with these principles in mind, and you should be building your components with these principles in mind as well. An obvious red flag to when this is not being respected is something like this. So we've seen this from a number of developers just getting started. They maybe come from building large-scale web applications, and they're used to putting just a lot of code in a file. So they start trying to build a component, and they put a ton of code in that file. Like this one here has over 2,000 lines of code. This is real code, too. Yeah. Chris and I saw this, and we're just like, oh, no. Like, what have uh. we done? Polymer was supposed to make things smaller and easier to work with, and we're still having developers write code that's looking like this. So we knew we needed to refocus the mindsets of our developers a bit. So in our training and our code reviews, we're basically driving home that a component should do one thing and one thing well. If it starts to get too large, then just break it up into smaller components. And again, focus on those demo pages, because no one's going to want to maintain this massive demo page of all the different permutations of a component. And once your team can internalize those, they become a well-oiled machine, and you can become a Polymer champion for your organization. So just to wrap it up, we really love Polymer. Polymer has been spreading like wildfire at Comcast because it's really simple to use. Like, it's much easier to learn than some of the other frameworks out there. The ability to reuse components, too, taking the Xfinity Home arm disarm module and dropping it on another site, it, it like blows products' mind when you can do that. And it's also much faster than anything else that's going to be out there. Once web components are native and running on the metal of the Chrome browser or any browser, it's so much faster than any framework can do. So again, that's why we really love Polymer. I'm Chris Lorenzo. I'm John Riviello. And we're from Comcast. Yeah. Thank you for your time. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Polymer team.